if we look at um, a number of healthy um, lifestyle factors combined, we have an analysis from the nurses health study and the health professionals follow up study that followed more than 170,000 men and women for over 30 years. And they examined the impact of five lifestyle factors, whether people had smoked, healthy weight, healthy diet, physical activity, and moderate rather than excessive alcohol consumption. And again, I will come back to alcohol because I don't endorse alcohol consumption when it comes to cancer prevention. Um, and a healthy diet in this study was uh, defined as being high in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and unsaturated fatty acids from plant foods. And it was low in red and processed meat and processed foods in general. And after the 30 years follow up, what it found was that people eating the best quality diet had a 30% reduced risk of dying from cancer and a 33% reduced risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. And if you had all five healthy lifestyle habits, you could slash your risk of dying from cancer in that 30 year period by 65% um, and cardiovascular um, death by 82%. So that's an enormous benefit of um, having healthy lifestyle habits. And what they showed was that those people at the age of 50 who were uh, adherent to the healthy lifestyle factors that I mentioned lived 12 to 14 years longer than those who were not following a healthy lifestyle. So these are extra years lived in good health, which is what we all want for ourselves. So coming back to the topic of this talk, cancer prevention and surviving well after a diagnosis of cancer. The cancer guidelines that I've mentioned uh, and from the World Cancer Research Fund really do work. So we've got a large analysis um, from two Swedish prospective cohort studies, which included more than 50,000 participants, followed for 15 years. And they showed, unfortunately, that most people are not meeting the recommendations of the World Cancer Research Fund. However, if people did, with each of the nine um, like healthy lifestyle habits that are recommended for each lifestyle factor, they could lower their risk um, of cancer by three to 4%. So that, that's pretty huge. And given that uh, most of the people were not adherent to these healthy lifestyle factors, what they did show was the maximum adherence would re result in about a 15% reduction in cancer risk. But the more you adopt these healthy lifestyle behaviors, the more benefits there are up for grabs. Similarly, in women, the Women's Health Initiative study, which included um, more than 50,000 postmenopausal women in its analysis, they followed them for 12 years and they showed that people who had intentionally lost weight um, had a 12% reduced risk of those cancers that are related to being overweight or obese, which I've listed again here, but there's 13 different cancers. And, you know, everyone wants to know, well, are my genes my destiny? And the clear cut answer is no, no for all the chronic conditions we, we deal with. And it's the same answer for cancer. This large study is one of just an example of one of many studies that have looked at the interaction between genetic factors and our lifestyle habits. Um, more than 300,000 people in the UK Biobank study followed for almost six years. And they looked at the um, healthy lifestyle factors and from their cancer um, prevention guidelines, and they correlated their association with 95 different genetic factors that increased the risk of colorectal cancer. And what the um, study was able to show was um, that if you were adherent to the healthy lifestyle factors, you could significantly reduce your risk of developing cancer, despite having um, a, an adverse genetic risk score, and that those in the highest genetic um, category had the most to gain from adopting healthy lifestyle behaviours and were able to reduce their risk of colorectal cancer by 42%. The trouble is that around the globe, and including the US, most people are not following these guidelines. This large analysis um, from the US showed that 70% of people were not meeting the cancer prevention guidelines. Um, and this included um, being an unhealthy um, heavy weight, not consuming enough fiber, and having a too high consumption of processed meat. And that really, as clinicians and health professionals like myself, we should be addressing these lifestyle factors in order to cut the risk of cancer in the 
the general population. What about cancer and diet? Well, again, from the Adventist Health Study and the Health uh, um, and, and the Epic Oxford Study, you can see that people avoiding all animal products, so vegans have a 16% lower risk of cancer and vegetarians an 8%. In the UK, it's a bit more, um, more with vegans cutting their risk by 19% and vegetarians by 11%. And when you look at all the data together, you can see that um, in a number of studies, uh, vegans have a 15% reduction in the risk of cancer. So just the diet piece alone of the recommendations could cut your risk of cancer by 15%. And this sort of level of 15% is consistent um, across a number of studies. So we also have a study from France with 50,000 individuals followed for four years, and they looked at the impact of following a healthy plant-based diet as shown here in the plate. And again, they showed that an over overall healthy diet um, consisting of healthy plant foods would cut, cut your risk of cancer by 15%. And this has just been published um, from the UK. The UK Biobank study um, showed, um, again, that vegetarians, so avoiding all animal flesh, reduce your risk of cancer by about 14%. Um, in women, an 18% reduction in breast cancer, mainly because vegetarian and vegan women were more likely to be a healthier weight. And in men, there was big advantages for cutting your risk of prostate cancer by around 31%. So coming back to alcohol, I keep saying that I'll come back to that. Now, it's really important to be clear about alcohol consumption. There are no health benefits to gain. Um, and for cancer prevention, all the guidelines say it's best not to drink alcohol. Around 6% of cancers globally are caused by um, consuming alcohol. And it's around seven different types of, of cancer that are related to alcohol consumption. And there's always a dose response. So, you know, um, you know, more you drink, the worse the risk. However, there is no safe limit. So even having, you know, a consumption within the range that the government deemed to be um, okay for most citizens increases your risk. And there are a number of mechanisms why um, alcohol um, can lead to cancer. Um, the main reason is because alcohol and its metabolite acetaldehyde actually damages DNA and the proteins in the cells. Um, the um, alcohol creates reactive oxygen species again, and these um, this causes oxidative stress and damages DNA protein and lipids within the cells. It impairs your ability to absorb the nutrients you need to prevent cancer. Alcohol increases your blood estrogen level, which um, we know can increase your risk of female cancers such as breast and endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. It acts as a solvent, so it increases the uptake of other carcinogens into your cells. So we're all exposed to carcinogens in our environment and it can increase the uptake in these cells. It alters the health of the gut microbiome. You only have to think that we put alcohol in our hands to, to sanitize um, uh, our hands. Um, and that's kind of what happens in our gut. It adversely affects our gut microbiome. We know that alcohol um, can shorten the length of the telomeres. It can affect the gene expression. Uh, um, so, you know, altering the expression of our genes and also can enhance the negative effects of tobacco smoking. And again, I think, you know, the medical community are also becoming aligned with this message that there is no safe limit. The World Heart Federation have come down hard on alcohol consumption. There is no benefit for heart health either when you look at global um, human health altogether. And in addition, another large study from the UK showed that for brain health, there is no safe limit. Any amount of alcohol um, is, is adversely affects the brain. And in this study, they looked at the size of the brain and various centers in the brain and showed shrinkage of the brain as people consumed alcohol. So I'll come back to what I think is a healthy drink, obviously water mainly for thirst, um, but also if you want to drink tea and coffee, it's absolutely fine, as long as it's not full of loads of um, dairy and cream and sugar. Um, you know, coffee and tea are full of healthy polyphenols um, and, and can be part of a healthy um, plant based diet. So a word on dairy, um, as I say, you know, the cancer guidelines will tell you that um, 
dairy can lead to a low risk of colorectal cancer. And certainly in observational studies, it does, but it's quite clear that it's the calcium. There's nothing else in dairy that is promoting this benefit. Um, and in contrast, we know that dairy consumption is associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer in men and may also increase the risk of breast cancer and endometrial cancer. And we can make better choices for cancer prevention because we know that women who consume soya milk instead of dairy milk slash their risk of breast cancer by about 32%. Um, and um, so really we can be making better choices for our health and there is no necessity for dairy at all. And it may be adversely affecting our health overall. Mm -hmm.